Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We are in the house of worship this evening to lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up your head, oh, you gates, and the King of glory shall come in. This King of glory, we've come to exalt him in this house. Church, we heard it preached magnificently this morning. This same King of glory can be found in the most unusual places. The key is that he can be found by any of us at any time, anywhere. And I say we take that same principle and we live out the words of Paul in Titus chapter 2 when he said he was looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ because he can be found anywhere, church, anywhere. And I am so thankful to be a people called by his name just having the opportunity to seek his face in a service in the house of worship with you here this evening. If you are a guest with us in the house or joining us online, we welcome you to First Pentecostal Church. We are simply delighted that you've chosen this evening to worship with us. We pray that the word of God blesses you and your home for those of you that are streaming. Church, we have several events coming up. Now listen, yesterday... We had a great time at our fellowship at the Knowles home, and I want to bless Brother and Sister Knowles for hosting. It was a wonderful time in the Lord. You know, church, if I can be candid with you, I learned a few things yesterday. You know, one of the things I learned yesterday is uh, Sister Kathy Johnston is a vision caster. Now, I think she pronounced it bossy, but... Vision caster nonetheless, Sister Kathy, it was great setting up with you yesterday. I learned that Sister Amanda Mills and Sister Courtney Scott play, play cornhole with great enthusiasm. <laughs> but we really did. We had a wonderful time. And if the food that was available there is any indication of what we have looking forward to at this chili cook-off coming up at the fall festival this Saturday, November the 4th. The time is from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Church, you are in for a treat. Now remember, this is for the whole family. There's going to be a bounce house. There's going to be food, vendors, games, prizes, sweets, and more. So come for a great time, but on your way out of service this evening, please stop by the information desk and pick up some flyers because we want you to invite your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends and family, and those that may not have already had this opportunity of fellowship. We want to welcome them into this body. So let's do that by loving them and making them a part of our community even before they have a chance to join us for service. Next Sunday, November the 5th, during the AM service, there will be a baby dedication. So please be sure that you sign up by Friday if you'd like to participate, and you can sign up online or by contacting the church office. Men of the Hour is happening here Saturday, November the 11th at 9.30 AM. Please RSVP online or at the information desk. And as Brother Strobel mentioned this morning, we want to make sure there's plenty of food for you when you come. So we need you to please make sure you register so we have a proper head count. We don't want anyone to go hungry. And if I could ask our ushers to please make their way forward as we prepare to give unto the Lord with our tithes and offerings. This is our opportunity to give back just a small portion because God continues to outdo himself, church. He continues to bless. He continues to make provision for us, not just in our finances, but in our health, in our families. And I am so thankful for what he's doing. But church, with all the provision, I would ask that you would turn your attention to the prayer board behind me. These are names and situations that they are looking to the face of God for that same provision, for the same hand of healing that we have experienced in our own lives. Church, if you know him to be faithful and you know him to be true to his word, I am asking you to lift your voice this evening and let's lift these needs to the Lord tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've just given us one more opportunity to step into your presence, Lord, to worship you and exalt you in this house.
Father, we ask that you would look upon every name and every family represented here that may be hurting, Lord, that may be in an hour of need, but we look to you with great expectation knowing, Lord, that you not only hear us when we pray, but you are ready and willing and able to move and to do the miraculous. Lord, we invite you to continue to have your way in this service, and we will turn it over to you, Jesus. Bless this time of worship and bless this word in Jesus' name. That has ever overcome your life And there is no rival That could ever stand against your might You've always been with us Every battle you've already won Oh, you've already won There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. Show me. 
will bless the Lord. This week, next Sunday, we'll be having regular service here on Sunday morning. You need to invite everybody you can, and let's have a great time in the Lord. God's going to give us a tremendous harvest next Sunday. Now remember, regular service is Sunday morning, but Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m., is the launch of our daughter work at the First Pentecostal Church of Pensacola Century Campus. And those of you that signed up, we'll see you there at 2 p.m., but we don't have enough room for everybody to come. Appreciate you signing up and being a part of that, but we will not be having service Sunday night. We'll be the only Sunday that we do that because we just want to launch it and we want people to know we have arrived and there's going to be a breakthrough. He's the God of the breakthrough. We might as well believe there's a, a breakthrough for centuries. Sister Ashante had to bring her mother to the hospital. We don't know what the issue is just yet, but would you lift your hands? Let's thank God for the, for the increase and the abundance of the church expanding and multiplying and also for a healing touch for Ashante's mama. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your healing power. I thank you that you're the God of the breakthrough. We release you in this place to accomplish your work. And I thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to clap your hands and you can be seated clapping your hands and shouting the victory. I read from two portions of scripture. You don't have to stand for the reading because I want to make a little commentary as I go along. Matthew 25 and 21. I want to choose one word to preach about tonight, just one. One word in the scripture. Jesus said, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. The word faithful is very important for this text to understand what God is asking you to do in this hour. Thou hast been faithful over a few things but I will make thee ruler over many things. And then he connects it to something that you wouldn't even think he would connect it to. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now this word that I want to use tonight is only found in one verse in the Bible, and it's Titus 2 and 10. And it's an unusual word, but yet it's common in the sense that its meaning is profound. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. My text is fidelity. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. How many of you are thankful for the doctrine of this church that has been taught for so many years, which is the foundation of what we believe? But some people sure do dress it up shabbily. Huh? Huh? The doctrine is meant to be adorned and dressed properly. And the only way you can do that is with good fidelity. And the only way you can do that is not purloining. Now, purloin in our language means stealing. So that's what our culture thinks. But in this language, it means holding back. How many people you know, though they attend church, but they still hold something back? They're not completed, completely committed. This word fidelity is really the word faith or faithfulness, but it actually refers to a conviction or a passion about what you believe that in order for it to be good fidelity, you've got to be passionate and you've got to be all in. Some people, they, they kind of, you know, 
stick their finger up in the wind and see which way the wind is blowing before they decide which side they're going to be on. I've already decided which side I'm going to be on. I'm going to be on the Lord's side. Well, God's on my side. No, the Bible says in the book of Joshua, whenever he was asked that very same question, no, God is not on your side. Joshua asked the captain of the Lord, which side are you on? Theirs or ours? He said, neither. He said, the the question, you're asking the wrong question. Whose side are you on? You got to find out which side you're going to be on and you need to choose. I choose the Lord. Amen. I said, I choose the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve whether it'll be God or whether it'll be the Lord's that you served on the other side of the flood. And so the word tonight is fidelity. Fidelity is defined as that quality of being faithful, being loyal, being all in. It's very much like our Lord to make fidelity the test of life. Of all the things that he could have chosen in his infinite wisdom, he made fidelity and faithfulness the main issue. Jesus always exalted what the world considers to be lowly virtues. Just as he took obscure and lowly men when he wanted to build his kingdom, he took obscure and lowly virtues when he wanted to build character. And it's not merely because fidelity is obscure, but because it's within the reach of everybody here. Everybody here can take your passion and conviction and be all in the kingdom. It's within the reach of all. That alone is what makes it so awesome because there's really nothing dazzling about fidelity and faithfulness. It's not at all a rare or splendid gift. There's no power to arrest the eyes are to get itself chronicled in the news. But it's just like the Lord and his passion for undistinguished people that he would then take and crown a virtue such as fidelity as the criterion of character. Isn't it amazing how Jesus works? There are many of us in this world who are not very brilliant. We're not very talented. We're just a part of the great army of the commonplace. But there is one thing that's within the reach of every one of you, and that is the steady practice of fidelity. Brother Kinsey, I'm all in. Whatever God wants, that's what I want. I'm on the Lord's side. I want to make it to heaven. I'm not going to hit and miss and be up one minute and down the next and don't know where I belong and where I'm at. I know exactly where I'm at. I am here in this place to serve Jesus with all my soul, mind, and strength, and I've got conviction. If you sit there and have no conviction in your worship, there's no good fidelity there. If you have no conviction in your attendance at church, then there's no fidelity there. If there's no passion in your desire to serve the Lord, you got to be all in. Sold out. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm sold out. Turn to somebody else and say, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm in everything. The inspiring thing is, is that our God would take something within the reach of everyone and make it the main building block of his kingdom. It's the character that he wants to develop in you is fidelity. Now consider, fidelity demands courage. You gotta really be courageous. You gotta be brave to be faithful. When you consider it all at all, fidelity demands a certain courage. In the parable from which our text was taken, the need for courage is quickly discerned because there was one man who was not faithful. He got his talent and he buried it. Well, I've only got one talent. He said, I was afraid. His infidelity was fear, fear of failure, fear fear of rejection, fear that his family wouldn't like him anymore if he decided to be faithful, fear that his friends wouldn't like him anymore if he showed passion and conviction and a commitment and an all-in. 
You'd be surprised at how much that can pull people away. The Lord hints at a truth with that negative illustration because there's courage maybe on the battlefield. There's courage if you go to Africa and face down a lion or some wild game. There's courage if you're going to try to climb to the top of Mount Everest. But there is also courage found in every avenue of life. And maybe it's the finest courage in the world in the sight of God, especially if not in the sight of men, is in quiet and steady courage of fidelity to do stuff when you don't feel like it, to worship and come to church when it's not convenient. It takes courage to come to the house of the Lord when everyone else is saying don't do it, to, to do your duty even though you got a headache or a heartache, whether you've got an up or a down situation in your life, you still stay faithful. There are few finer things in this world than the rare moment of somebody that says, I'm all in and I have the courage to be faithful. Fidelity means victory is carried into the commonplace on the common day. When I'm doing common things, I'm still excited about Jesus. When I have to get up in the morning and I don't want to read and I don't want to study and I don't want to pray and I don't want to do those things, but I do them anyway because it is the will of God and I feel a pull from another world and there's a conviction on my heart that I might need something from the Lord today to help give somebody else a blessing and a help. Fidelity illuminates the low and the dreary places of life, but fidelity is also what makes your dreams come true because life only becomes a victory when our common days are full of victories of which no one else hears. Nobody hears about it. Let me say in passing that this was the courage of my Jesus himself. He displayed it at all times. We talk about many things concerning Christ, but what I am so amazed about was his tremendous, unwavering courage to face the Pharisees, to face the cross, to face the everyday, to face the crowd when they were so needy, pulling on him at all times for another miracle. It took courage for him to leave heaven and come down here upon the earth. It took courage for him to remain at Nazareth until he was 30 when he knew his true purpose. He knew what he was supposed to be doing, but he did what he needed to do at the time to get ready for when his purpose would be fulfilled. He took courage to resist the devil and his temptations to be given all of the kingdoms of this world in the wilderness of temptation. When the winning of those kingdoms was his passion, He scorned delights. He labored every day. And he knew that every step took him closer to the cross. But he did not mind the long trail that led to Calvary because he faced it with courage. He even stopped and ministered to people on the way carrying his cross and said, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children because there's a resurrection coming for me. What awesome courage it all took. When we're tempted to think we're missing out on things, you better remember Jesus When we're tempted to rebel at the seeming drudgery of life, we need to remember Christ. We need to remember him who never ran away from anything that confronted him. We need to remember that he will not put any more upon you than you can bear. If Jesus took up his cross daily and he carried it all the way to Mount Calvary, then so can you pick up that cross. I don't understand why this has happened to me. I don't either, but pick that cross up and carry it with conviction. I say, come on to church anyhow when you don't feel like it and you praise the Lord just like you've got the victory, even though you don't even see it on the horizon. Pentecostals quit sitting back checking on seeing whether or not the church is going to be victorious. I've already read the book and I'm standing on a promise greater than you are. I'm standing on a promise greater than you are. Quit waiting on whether it's going to be victorious. The church is going to be victorious. Upon this rock, I will build my church. I want to know, are you all in? 
are you all in? Not purloining. Not holding back. You see, it really, think about it. This is something everybody can do. Every one of you. Every one of you children can be faithful. Every one of you teenagers can be faithful. You can learn to be faithful. There's nothing that is as half as brave as a man can be in the face of adversity. They can face death. They can smile with a defiance that facing when all the odds are against them. They will take on any hazard, court any danger, hurt themselves at any opposition, and will snap their fingers at any fate and shake his fist at torture and at death because they believe in what they are doing. And so there are many kinds of courage, the courage that we would do well to contemplate, to develop. It is that courage that's not born of any kind of excitement. Whew. Let me say this, Pentecostals. We are drunk on excitement. We are running from one conference to another, from one prophetic voice to another. We're listening on the internet trying to find another prophetic voice that preaches and speaks our future into existence. And I, if you want to realize your future, just find you a local church and be faithful and be all in and serve with passion and watch God open every door he wants to open and lift you to every place. Fidelity. It's so needed in the church today. I want to be all in. Fidelity is then now rewarded by added capacity. Think about it. The scripture text says, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make thee ruler over many things. When you're faithful over something small, you're rewarded by greater things. If you, if you got to whine about the small things, God's not going to give you a bigger thing because you sure will whine. None of us could stand you then. If you're going to whine about doing a small thing, then you're going to whine about doing something greater. You have no capacity. There's no, great, there's no increase of capacity until you're faithful in a small thing. Get excited about a small thing. Start celebrating one soul that gets the Holy Ghost and my God just might open the door and give you a hundred. Yeah. Celebrate over a kid getting the Holy Ghost and you just might get 50. Yeah. Your problem is you want excitement. You want a weapon and God won't let you have a weapon, but he will let you be faithful. Someone is a slacker on a job, he's not going to be offered a bigger one. Oh, yeah, you slacked and won't come to church. We'll give you this job. It's a real hard job. <laughs> you can't be faithful for five hours, so we're going to give you a job for 12 hours. That'll make you faithful. Giving somebody a bigger job when they're a slacker will not help them. On the other hand, if someone has a good work record, attendance record, faithfully discharges his duties, he will be promoted. It's not the bigger task, it's the bigger capacity. It's the capacity to do the bigger task. Real rewards are not entitled. You're not entitled to them. They come after toil. It's a reward for the service. That's what gives you the greater power to serve. Sister Tenney told me one day she was asking me to do something after she had asked me to do 300 other things. And she said, you, you don't ever ask a lazy person to do something else. You always find the busiest preacher and ask him to do it and it will get done. Nobody will ask me to do anything if you're not faithful in the small things. You're not excited about the small things. 
My pastor told me I had to get excited about cutting the grass. I needed to shout and dance while I, I mowed the lawn. Back then, it was only push mowers. All y'all got the riding mowers, you lazy outfits. Oh, you ride around on them little no turn or no this or no that. I had to push that mower all over that crazy churchyard. And he said, you got to shout about it. You can't come in here whining because I told you to cut the yard. You got to come in here praising God and be faithful over the small things. To be faithful in the least is when you'll qualify for what's greater. I wish this word would get so deep in your heart and turn you around and set you apart. I believe that you ought to do this with the whole heart. The lowliest thing ought to be done with the whole heart. And when you do the lowliest thing, that's what will make you ready for the higher thing. I tell you why some people can't advance is because they can't help anybody else advance. Why aren't y'all running the aisles? I'm really upset about this. Where's Jacob? He's not here tonight. <laughs> I guess he ran out this morning. <laughs> you in the back, Jacob? Okay, I, I can't see you. You're back there too far. Amen. You got to do it with your whole heart. You got to have good fidelity. So live that whatever the world may have in store, he whose word can never pass away will open the door and make you ruler over many things. Life will deepen and be enriched for you. The small daily victories will strengthen you. And those victories really do count. True wealth, the avenue to pleasing God is fidelity. Now I'm going to tell you why people are so unhappy and miserable being apostolic full of the Holy Ghost. Tell you why. It's very simple. My text told you. Because not only do you have greater capacity, the only way for you to enter into the joy of the Lord is to be faithful. There's no other way. The Lord associates fidelity with joy. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Don't you believe this statement is so profoundly true? Here are two men engaged in the same task. Both are intelligent and skillful working men, but one is careless and does not do his job very well, and the other is faithful, laboriously faithful. And at the end of the day, when the work is done, which one do you think is going to have the better feeling? The one who was faithful. The poet Wadsworth said of a faithful man, flowers laugh before thee in their beds. Unfaithfulness moves towards the dark, but fidelity pitches its tent toward the sunrise. When you're faithful, it'll be awesome when the task is done, especially when the morning breaks on that distant shore on the other side. <laughs> but the joy of a job well done is worth it right here and right now because he's not just talking about the joy in the pie in the sky. He's talking about the joy of the Lord right now. That's why you can't worship with joy. That's why you can't praise him with joy. You can't have, you can't celebrate anything. You can't celebrate somebody else's advancement and the blessing of the Lord. You got to go tear them down and make them feel bad because God's using them in Bible studies or something else. Or oh, you think you're spiritual. No, I know you're not. Praise God. <laughs> I may not be spiritual, but I know it ain't you, praise God. So I'm just going to go find out where it's at because <laughs> I, I won't find it here. I'm just telling you to get you to a frame of mind. Quit trying to make everything happen just for you. Get connected to somebody else's dream. 
I want Mickey to be successful in Century. I want Gerald to be successful in the young people. I want Brother Strobel to be successful in whatever he does. I want you to succeed. And the more God blesses you, the more I like it. People don't even know how to take me. They'll start bragging, God's blessed me. And then I start shouting and praising the Lord. That's what I've been doing all of my life is to try to get the blessing of the Lord on everybody around me. Because I figure if I can do that, some of it just might splash on me. I just might get a little bit of some of that myself. I found if I went into a church and I was good and I was connected to the pastor and I connected to his vision and I helped him realize his dream for whatever he wanted for that church, that one day God would give me my dream. And guess what? I found out. I found my dream in trying to help somebody else fulfill their dream. And when you can get the jealousy out of your spirit and just get good fidelity. When I put people in this pulpit, I want them to do better than they've ever done in their life. Why? Because it does not hurt for somebody else to get blessed. I'll tell you what'll give you joy is when you watch what other things come against people and it takes them out and it takes them down, but it come, the same thing comes to you and it bounces off of you like bullets off of Superman. They go through a storm and they're so messed up, they got to go through eight years of therapy before they can get over it. And you go through the same thing and in eight minutes, you're on the other side praising God that God brought you through because you've been faithful. When you're faithful, you're going to be able to fight to the finish. When you're faithful, you know God's going to pull you through. When you're faithful, you pull yourself together and you realize I'm not going to quit till the job's done. And when it's done, it's going to be done right. Hallelujah. It's a heroic moment in your life when you discover that. Especially when only God knows it, the angels know it, Nobody else knows it, and if they did, they won't recognize it. No drums are beating, no bands are playing, no eyes watching. As far as the natural eye can see, there may be nothing ahead but anguish. There's no rift in the clouds that hang over them. They don't see any glimmer of light on the horizon. Yet they resolve themselves to face whatever is there. If they go down, so be it. I'm going to fly every flag I've got. <laughs> and if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down in a flight of flags. I belong to Jesus. And I may, I may, I may be dead, but I'm, I'm, I've been faithful. Hallelujah. I want to say along with Esther, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going into the king and I'm going to try to deliver the Jews. I want to say like Job, though God slay me, yet will I trust in him. I want to know, does anybody still have that kind of spirit? Even when the crucifixion awaited Christ in Jerusalem, he said, so be it. His face was set like a flint to go there. Even though Paul knew that bonds and afflictions awaited for him in Jerusalem. He said, so be it. He told the people, quit weeping and crying for me. He was still going because he felt like he had to. Few deeds of valor can rival fidelity among the world's conspicuous gallantries. And without one cheery word or one handshake of congratulations, these heroes of fidelity turn their faces toward the cold, toward situations that are heartbreaking and forlorn. You cannot judge one person's courage against another. Get out of the judgment business of judging where other people are at. 
because you don't know what their childhood, upbringing, environment, their natural tendencies to be shy or retested, their losses, their hurts, their disappointments, their weaknesses, their strengths. There's a lot of exhibitions of courage that are never going to win any medals of honor, but they are awesome to say the least. I'm sorry, but my heroes are not athletes and my heroes are not movie stars and my heroes are not rock stars. If your daddy's serving God, he's a hero. If he's holding a job trying to put food in your face, you ought to thank God for it. Your mama is a hero. They may not be perfect, but they're still heroes. Your Sunday school teacher is a hero. Your preacher is a hero. Your school teacher is a hero. I say anybody who's lived for God faithfully in this church is a hero. Hallelujah. You show me somebody who's been living for God in the length of time and I'll show you somebody with fidelity and they have courage. It will not be heralded in the history books. They won't be on the front page of the newspaper, but it's the greatest kind of courage because in face of all of life's obstacles, they're still worship and praise the Lord. They don't let offense stop them. They don't let tragedy stop them. They don't let bitterness stop them. They don't let a handicap stop them. They don't let injustice stop them. They keep fighting on. They keep worshiping on. They keep believing. Believe in God for his mercy to extend to them in the time of darkness and trouble. And they know that my God is a just God. And he is a sure recompense of reward. That one day he's going to reward me. And it may not be here, but one day I'm going to get my reward. One day I'm going to get my reward. Ronnie Albritton, you're my hero standing up here in the face of loss and you never quit and you never stopped and you kept worshiping and you kept praising God. You're my hero. Sharon, you're my hero. You kept praising God in the midst of your loss. You didn't quit. You didn't get bitter. You kept blessing the Lord. You kept clapping your hands. You're my heroes. It's sobering to think how much you got to study and prepare, not just for life's works, but for your daily duties. Lawyers spend hours preparing their cases. Doctors study for years to become proficient in their labors. And aren't you glad when they got the knife in their hand and the gleam in their eye? And I want to see some lines in that face of that little brother. I want to know he's done this before. And this ain't his first time. Say, oh, I'm going to practice on you. I don't know just where it's at. Don't know the difference between your liver and your heart. <laughs> huh? You want him to go to school and be able to know just where he's supposed to be. Fidelity is just simply necessary, not just to be a good lawyer or a good doctor, but to make heaven. I said to make heaven. You see, if a lawyer makes a mistake, his client may go to prison. And if a doctor makes a mistake, well, he may suffer for it or he may die. But what a preacher, if he makes a mistake, if he makes a mistake on the doctrine, his mistakes can be eternal. So I say, church, let us be faithful over a few things that the Lord has called us to, that we may be faithful over many things. I say God's calling this church to fidelity and not just any kind of fidelity. I'm talking about Woo, hallelujah, I'm talking about good fidelity. I'm talking about good fidelity, all in, not purloining, all in. So Brother Kenzie, I'm not sure about all this worship. Not purloining. Best thing to do is join us. You're afraid you're going to like it. <laughs> Praise God. He said, I'm not acting like all you crazy people. Oh, I wished you would. 
I, I, it'll get a hold of you one night and knock you seven ways from Sunday. You don't even know who you are for the next six hours. I just ask for it in the name of Jesus. Slay every last one of you in the spirit where we got to take you out here on a cart somehow. We got to call 911. I like that song. <laughs> what, what, the devil's in the phone booth calling 911 because he knows he's in trouble. First Pentecostal church just woke up and realized your faithfulness means the most. It means more. See, I'm going to be here on Wednesday night. I'm going to be worshiping on Wednesday night. And then I'm going to come back here Sunday morning. I'm going to be worshiping then. And then when we go over there at 2 o'clock, I'm going to be tired. You say, you're not going to be tired? I'm going to be tired. I've already know I'm going to be tired. I've already, I already understand that. But when I walk into that church, I'm not even preaching and I'm tired. But I'm going to worship and I'm going to praise God. And I'm going to work the altar if I get anybody. I, I might just get some of the saints up there and pray them all through again. Woo, I just wish somebody would be faithful. I just wish somebody would say, I'm all in. I'm behind you. I'm behind the mission of this church. Instead of all this other mess that people do in the games that people play, just get all in. You see, church, I've been all in my whole life long. All my life, it's been all in. From the time I was just a kid, there's never been a time that it's wavered. The fire has always burned. When I, when I went through a dry season at Provence, so you can stand, I'm done. When I went through a dry season in Provence, the Lord was just preparing me for something greater. And it didn't make no difference. If I couldn't get a breakthrough here, I went somewhere else and got one. <laughs> I'd go to because of the times and lay on the floor and cry and weep. Sister Vesta Mangle would just beat us up, slap us, pick us back up, and slap us down again. There were times we couldn't even get up. We were just knocked out in the spirit where the Holy Ghost was working. I'd go to the campground. Then they found out I'd do a good job, and then they gave me more jobs. And I said, I should have done a bad one, praise. <laughs> they gave me more than I wanted, but I was faithful. I was faithful. And so you have to learn to do that. And I'm teaching these young people the building block of character. That's true character. And, and I, I love you. Don't, don't get me wrong. I understand what you're saying. But when you sit back and say, well, I don't want to be deceived and I don't want to be confused. I'm going to tell you what your problem is. You've deceived yourself. And it's self-deception that you've got to worry about, not anybody else. I'm not worried about anybody deceiving me. God takes care of all of that. But I guarantee you, I pray about, Lord, don't let me deceive my own ignorant self. That's the key. You're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. Confusion comes because you have a love problem. You don't love Jesus like you need to. Because when you love him, you can leave the questions to him, knowing that he will keep them safe until it's time to answer them. You don't have questions, brother. Everybody here, if you don't have a question in your mind, you're not thinking. Your brain's shut down or something. I don't know. Maybe you don't have one. <laughs> I don't know if Brother Mick Harris is there, but where are you? I love it when I walk by him and I kind of, you know, 
rub his head to see if a genie will pop out. <laughs> Magic lamp. Then I say, oh, well, that's what I thought. Nothing's there. <laughs> I do love you, Brother Mick. I really do. I do. I do love you. You're awesome. You are awesome. But be faithful. Be faithful. Not purloining, but with good fidelity, adorning the doctrine in all things. On your job, at the home, be faithful. At church, wherever you're at. really important so I want you to take somebody by the hand and in agreement I want you to bring them to the front with your desire and your commitment all in commitment to be faithful take them by the hand and you come on up here just say this is th this won't make you faithful it won't make you not purloining but at least it's your public testimony your commitment. It's just like when people take vows at a marriage, it doesn't mean their marriage will last. You know it won't last if they don't take the vow. There's no marriage there. That's what marriage is. It's a covenant relationship. When you're in a covenant relationship, then it makes a difference. I'm in a covenant relationship with my wife. And because I'm in covenant with her, it's different than if you're just a partner. Everybody uses the word partner now. No, I'm in a covenant relationship. It's more than a partnership. She's in a covenant relationship with me. And so I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and I want you to say, I commit to being faithful. And that means two things. Number one, I'm all in. I'm all in. And I'm all in at all times. Turn. I'm all in at all times. I don't mean that sometimes you're down and sometimes you're up. or I, I don't mean that. But whether you're down or up, you're all in. You're all. So I thank God for you. I thank God for the church that has good fidelity. Good fidelity. This building is here because of lolly bears and dinners and more dinners and more insane dinners. Peanut brittle, oh Jesus, don't get me started on that. I was trying not to mention it and get all excited about it. I remember when I tried to go back there and make peanut brittle, Doris had to jump all over me. You better pour that right now. You remember that? I'm trying to forget, I, I understand. <laughs> I mean, you only, I, I, from what I understand, uh, just from the, what I've observed, and I haven't done that much, you got just a small window. You got to do whatever you're supposed to do with it. I don't remember what I was supposed to do, but whatever it was, I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> and I heard about it, praise God. Because we don't want to waste any of it, because if you're going to make a profit and pay this church off, you got to make a profit. So I understand that. That's why I just said, I bless y'all. <laughs> and I decided to move on. <laughs> Let the professionals do their job. And they were pros, I'm telling you. And I'm a peanut brittle connoisseur, kind of like donuts. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, y'all made the best. <laughs> oh, I would just, it's like crack cocaine to me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to eat it. <laughs> and then, 
Then my wife brings this whole bag. They used to have two of them in a bag. Before you knew it, it was all gone. She said, you eat both of those? I said, no, I'm keeping one back. She said, where? Right here, praise. <laughs> faithful the point is they were faithful and now this this whole property here we have the annex paid for kitchen remodel paid for century church building paid for we will pay for this in just a few months what we did to remodel it we did borrow the money I came to you you remember all that you voted for me to do it so I did it but we'll pay this off in just a few months. We're just a few months away. God has blessed us, but it's only because of good fidelity. Who's all in? I'm all in. Jesus, I'm all in. So I want you to just for, for a moment, they're going to sing. And you're going to begin to pray and say, God, now I've said it to my brother and sister, whoever you said it to, I'm all in. Now you want, I want you to say it to God. I, I don't want you to say it fast like you did to the others, which was fine. But I want you to say, God, I'm all in. And you got to help me with all my craziness, but I'm all in. And we all got the craziness that's got to be dealt with by the Lord. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not bad. You just got to give it to him. Now lift your hand and say, God, I want you to cry it out to him. I want you to cry it out. I want you to cry it out. Come on now, pray. I want you to cry out like we did yesterday at that meeting. 86 churches. Somebody around you and we're going to pray together in the name of Jesus in one mind and one accord and we're going to bless the Lord right now and we're just going to commit in the name of Jesus to be all in and faithful as we have already spoken to each other and before the Lord we're just going to pray <laughs> let the Holy Ghost begin to use you and minister to you right now let the power of God come on you oh I'm all in for my family. I'm all in for the church. I'm all in for the kingdom of God. I'm all in.
Everybody's different. It's all.